Hi friends, so uh, this is now our sixth session in our study of the book of Revelation. And we're in the part of the book where the prophet John is uh, well, channeling Jesus' word to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And as I mentioned, the idea was that when John's prophetic book of the revelation of Jesus was uh, finally completed, it would be taken around from church to church, and, and each of the churches would hear Jesus' verdict, not only on their own church, but on all their other neighboring uh, churches as well. So we've now heard Jesus speak to the angels of the church of Ephesus and Smyrna, and today we're about to hear what Jesus has to say to and about the church of Pergamum. And we pick up our reading with the 12th verse of the second chapter, where Jesus tells John, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. And we recall that this is referring to the word of God that is, as we're told in the book of Hebrews, uh, fourth chapter, 12th verse, living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's the, that's the sword that Jesus has in his mouth. And we who are Lutherans, we claim that the, the word of God is more than just the, the printed word that we find in the Bible. The word made flesh is Jesus, God's only begotten son. So I don't think that this image is so much intended to get us ready to uh, see physical conflict or, or physical violence, although we're certainly going to find violent images in this book. But I think that the image of the two-edged sword here is to remind us that Christ's work will be done through the word of God that pierces our souls, convicts us of our needs, and transforms us into servants of God. As far as uh, Pergamum goes as a city, this is a, a city of about 180,000 people at that time, which was really very large. It was the seat of Roman government in the province of Asia, and it was very much an epicenter of the imperial cult that worshipped the emperor. And the, the living word then goes on to tell John to tell that church in Pergamum, I know where you are living, where Satan's throne is, yet you are holding fast to my name, and you did not deny your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan lives. Now this Reference to Pergamum as the place where Satan's throne is could be referring to the fact that this is uh, such a, a center for the worship of the, the emperor, or it could be a reference to the fact that this was where the, uh, the uh, great altar to Zeus was, or where the proconsul's judgment seat was, or it could be, you know, it could be any. And in all of those together, uh, that might be what it is meant when it's talking about uh, the place where Satan lives. Any of the facts on their own might be enough, but all together uh, might certainly sum up into being that. But in spite of the pressures of their environment, Jesus holds them up as a model of faith for the church in an apparently evil environment. And Jesus praises them for the fact that they have clung to their faith even when under duress, even when one of their number was persecuted, maybe lynched for his faith in Jesus. They didn't deny their faith, but they held to it. Now, we don't really know anything at all about this Antipas other than what we find in this verse. He was a martyr, which is to say that he was one who witnessed, which is what the word martyr means. He witnessed to the reality and the grace of God revealed in the person of, of Christ Jesus, and he held fast to his witness to Christ, even to the point of death. In our time and in our context, it, it takes a bit of imagination to understand how this must have impacted the church of Pergamum. 
imagine that things had gotten just very conflicted between our church community and the, the greater community at large to the point where one of our members, one of your, your friends, was taken off the streets and perhaps beaten and then certainly killed for the fact that he believed in Christ and he worshipped him in the way that you worship him. Imagine the pressure that would place on you. I mean, how would you react? Would you be tempted to hide the fact that you too hold the same beliefs? Would you be tempted to stop going to church for a while, maybe just until uh, things settle down, the dust settles a bit? Would you downplay your faith in public places, even though you might maintain it in your heart? Would you maybe make a bit more of a show of your support for the emperor and your patriotism uh, to the, the Roman nation? It's a tough thing to, to even imagine for us. The pressure would certainly be against you. But apparently, Jesus thinks that they did just a cracking job of maintaining their witness in that very difficult time. Still, Jesus goes on to say in the 14th verse, But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel so that they would eat food sacrificed to idols and practice fornication. And this is a, a tough bit, really. So uh, you can read the story of Balak and Balaam in, in Numbers, the uh, 22nd through the 24th chapters, mostly. And in that story, Balaam was a non-Israelite prophet. Uh, and the king Balak of Moab tried to persuade him to put a curse on the Israelites as they were entering the land of Canaan. But Balaam apparently received word from that one true God, the God of the Israelites, not to do that. So he didn't, even though he was offered riches and was perhaps threatened and berated uh, for not doing so. So really, when I read that story in Numbers, I come out with the idea that uh, uh, Balaam uh, was a, a pretty good guy that refused to do anything counter to what God told him to do. However, that being said, there are also snippets in other places in our Bible where a less flattering tradition of Balaam slips out. He is at least blamed for teaching King Balak to entice the people of Israel to fornicate. And here the word fornicate or you know, commit adultery might refer to physically doing so, although it certainly refers to spiritual fornication in which the Israelites would be tempted to uh, lay aside their, their commitment to God and God alone and take up relations with the gods of the people of the land that they were entering into. And I don't really know the background of how those uh, traditions rose up as to who Balaam was or why he took that bad rap, but that's apparently what John is holding against the church of Pergamum. And this seems to be one of the major axes that John has to grind against many of the churches. He sees them as not being as singularly devoted to Jesus as they should be. Instead, he sees them as compromising their witness by not separating themselves more fully from the religious practices of their neighbors. And, and this will raise up, once again, an enemy of the church that John has already previously warned us about and warned these churches against. He says now in verse 15, So you also have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And again, we don't really know much about the Nicolaitans outside of these few references in the book of Revelation, but the Nicolaitans are the ones that John sees as continuing the practices of Balaam. Uh, they're apparently leading the people to believe that it's okay to eat foods sacrificed to idols, perhaps to make minor allowances for the practices of emperor worship or, or communal worship of, of local deities, and John will just have none of it. We talked earlier about how John and Paul 
might have been uh, a bit conflicted on this particular matter, since Paul had taught earlier that if you ate meat that had been sacrificed to a god that didn't really exist, so long as you were fully convinced that you were not participating in the, the worship of that god, it, it was not really a sin. Only and, and now Paul was a stickler for this. You shouldn't do anything that might undermine the faith of the weaker Christians around you. Anyway, John didn't seem to be that lenient with the churches uh, that he held under his care. He seems to have been much more strict on the subject himself. And so he says to the church of uh, Pergamum in the 16th verse now, Repent then. If not, I will come to you soon and make war against you with the sword of my mouth. And here the warning is clear. They are to cease and desist all actions that would compromise their position as being counter to anything like the worship of the imperial cult or the pagan gods. And if not, he'll come to make war with that two-edged sword. And I have to say that the more I hear John, the more I have to ask myself if what he's threatening is so much that Jesus is going to come and make war with them with the, the sword of his, his mouth, or if this is John's warning that he's coming and he's going to come and, uh, and really give them a good and proper shakedown now in the name of the Lord. And, and the truth is that, that maybe he wouldn't really see any difference between these two things. In practice, he might be saying exactly that if he doesn't hear pretty soon that they've clearly separated themselves from all of these practices uh, that would uh, uh, resemble what the Nicolaitans uh, have been uh, preaching, he's going to be packing up his bags and be on his way, and they're not going to be very happy to see him and hear what he has to say when he shows up. But even in that, he believes that what he's doing is bringing Jesus' own presence to them, and that it's actually Jesus who will be redressing them for their practices. Once again, John reminds us that what is being said now to one church is being said for the benefit of all the churches, as he says, let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And this is a reminder to us, even today, that these aren't just historical words and, uh, and kind of interesting things to note that have happened in the past, but these words are reminders to us that we should take these thoughts to heart and ask ourselves how they might reflect our own conditions today? Have we tried to make ourselves all but indistinguishable from the larger society? Have we given in to temptations to live with, you know, one foot in Rome and the other foot in the kingdom of heaven? That's certainly a temptation, even in the United States of America in this in this new century where it's so very easy to want to follow the, the gods of the masses, we may not worship the emperor or, you know, I don't know, maybe some of us do. We, we may not worship Artemis or, or Zeus or any of those other uh, pagan gods, but, but there are very many who worship mammon in the gods of fame and the God of style and popularity and beauty. So, so these words of warning are certainly as valid for us today as they were for the church of Pergamum so very long ago. John's Jesus then promises the people, to everyone who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give a white stone, and on the white stone is written a new name that no one knows except the one who receives it. So those who are able to rise up to the challenge of living out their faith in an uncompromising fashion will be given some of the hidden manna. This is, of course, a reference to the miraculous food that God sent the Hebrews to sustain them in the wilderness when God had freed them from slavery in Egypt. A bit of that manna was said to have been 
kept in a jar in the Ark of the Covenant that the people carried with them wherever they went, but, but that Ark was lost over the years. Whether John is speaking of physically getting to taste this or if he intends it in a metaphorical sense is pretty hard to say. It could be the idea that God would miraculously sustain them in their own wilderness journey through persecution just as God had once sustained the children of Israel. And the promise of that white stone with a, a new name on it, it, you know, it could refer to many things, but one thing it might refer to is an amulet such as were popular in those days and thought to be uh, powerful protectors against curses and diseases and such. Having a new or unknown name might be thought to give that amulet special protective powers names and, and getting new names and knowing the name of another were all thought to uh, be a source of power or a control over another person. In the Bible, there are often cases where God gives a person a, a new name uh, that denotes a rise in their status or a new chapter in their lives or a new direction that their lives are taken. We remember that God uh, once renamed Abram in Sarai and they became Abraham and Sarah. And we also remember that Jesus renamed uh, Peter. And in that case, uh, there may have been you know, something of a, a play on words since the, the Greek word for uh, Peter was similar to the Greek word for rock. And the, um, uh, the Aramaic word for rock was uh, similar sounding to the word uh, uh, Cephas or Kephas. And so those kinds of things would indicate then, for instance, with Jesus, that he was trying to emphasize that character in Jesus that was going to become the foundation of the church. So <laughs> perhaps we better leave now the, uh, uh, the exploration of the letter to the Church of Pergamum uh, as our time is running a bit short. And, and as always, I want to invite you to uh, join me as we close in a word of prayer. Holy God, we give you thanks for our freedom to worship you as we see best without fear of much persecution. However, we know that in many times and places and even in our world today, there are those who lack these freedoms and who worship you only at their own peril. We ask that you would raise them up, strengthen them, fill them with faith in you and the courage to hold on to their faith. And we pray that you would incite in us the kind of decisiveness that would allow us to live out our witness to you even more boldly at this time due to the freedoms that you've given us rather than falling back into complacency and, and compromise. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, once again, I give thanks that you'd spend this time with me as we uh, continue in our study of the book of Revelation. And I, I pray that you're blessed by these, these words, encouraged and inspired to live out your life and your witness faithfully in our lives and in our situation today. Go in peace, live as a faithful witness to our Lord in whatever circumstances may befall us. Thanks be to God.